to hello everybody. My name is Pampoyatos. I am part of the ICMAT and also from the CMB nearby. So I'm lucky enough to talk about confounding. And I decided to start with this sentence, which is compelled. So apparently, confounding is one of the main highlights of the Castle Revolution. So for him, is one of the main outputs uh, of these ideas that we are discussing. So it's a long chapter, like all that, the ones that we are discussing. So I decided that yes, I will discuss some concepts. So the first concept is going to get back to exchangeability. Okay. Then I will go to what they call the backdoor criterion. What do you see? Uh, after some examples of the backdoor criterion, I will discuss the traditional approach to co-founding and see the sort of the limitation. Traditional approach. Okay. So this is the core of, I think, what I will try to discuss today. And then if I have time, I will discuss this idea of switches which is single wall intervention graphs and the idea of compounding adjustments. But these two, if I have, I have the time. So let's start with this changeability, which is something that we have discussed over the different days. So the basic idea of exchangeability is you know, when you have this sort of treatment and you have the potential outcomes, let's say in the binary case, right? And the idea of exchangeability somehow is to bring to observational studies this idea of randomization, right? So what you're basically arguing is that uh, independently of the treatment, the distribution of potential outcomes is the same, right? This is behind exchangeability. And the main problem with confoundings and confounders is that somehow you, you lack of this exchangeability. So you have some sort of observational data where you don't have this exchangeability. And we can think of this pedestrian example. You recall it when you had sort of the treatment, the guy who was looking already up and the outcome, the second guy. And you're trying to understand the causal relationship between these two guys. And then there's a thunder, which is somehow uh, mixing the causal association, present relation, right? So you, as I said, you have you have this sort of lack of exchangeability, you have the treatment. Okay. They're trying to see whether there's a causal association between the treatment and the outcome. Right. And then you have, in between, you have some sort of factors. Which are here, the founder that I was telling you before, and these factors somehow are influencing both the treatment and the outcome and the relationship between the treatment of the, of the outcome, right? So then, let's say the main definition, or let's say the intuition be, uh, behind the idea of compounder is that you have a situation where you have this lack of exchangeability, <clears throat> right? So what are the consequences of, of the appearance of these factors? Okay, these are three. We write it down. We have something like this. And then you suddenly have some sort of factors here. Acting on, on the causal graph. Okay. So what happens when you have these factors? First, opens a, a what they call a backdoor. Backdoor path. Okay, these are these paths which are starting finishing here, the treatment. Okay. So these paths, if you don't consider the causal link, are those paths which are connecting the treatment with the outcome, right? So when you have these factors, then one of the first consequences is that they open these factor paths. 
Ja nyt kun siis biases, which are no, known as compounding. So the, 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 the word is itself a little bit strange. So compounding meant originally mixing, right? And the idea was that you had some sort of effects which were somehow mixing the causal effects that you were originally looking for, right? So confounding literally means mixing or meant mixing in the original day. Okay. So you have some sort of effects, the presence of these other factors which are mixing the correlation or genetic correlations. And then the third consequence is that you have actually associations which are real, but, and this is a big part, and we also interpret it. Okay, so again, the, the intuition behind uh, confounders is that you have, or confounding is that you have a lack of exchangeability, okay? So you have factors which are opening a, what they call backdoor paths, okay? You can think of all those paths which are starting like this, okay? The presence of this factor causes biases, and then the associations then that you have uh, between treatment and the outcome are real, but cannot be causally interpreted with have previous correlations. A re real, what, what is... Uh... Well, real in the sense that, uh, uh, I think this comes historically from the idea that uh, when they had confounders at the beginning, the original discussions, they thought that this was some sort of magic effects, right? And I think by real, they mean here that you do have these effects. Basically, that somehow they, they cannot be interpreted in a causal way. So I think and, that's behind the, the real. And, and do they discuss uh, whether the confounders are measured or not measured? Well, they will discuss in, in, the, in the next slide. Or... Okay. <clears throat> then, as you see immediately, and this is probably the goal of the chapter. have defined, uh, or I have used this concept of exchangeability, which is these ideas that we were discussing before, right? So that the potential outcomes are independent of the treatment, which is part of the framework of the potential outcomes. And on the other hand, I have explained this also in the context of causal graphs, okay? Like you have the treatment, A, you have the outcome, why and you have these sort of factors, right? So you see there is a mixture of the two frameworks that we are dealing with in causality. You have this argument of the lack of exchangeability that we have used with the potential outcomes, okay? And then in order to understand this, this sort of implication of this lack of exchangeability, we are going to the framework of, of, of tax, right? Of directed cyclic graphs and causal, causal graphs, okay? So how do they, we relate uh, these two frameworks? Okay, it's not easy. Uh, this is what they say. It's not easy to relate, but then uh, we propose two ways to, to relate these two ideas. The first one, the one that I will discuss now is this backdoor criterion, okay? And the second one is uh, what they call I switch single world intervention graph, okay? The way, again, we are coming from exchangeability. We, we have discussed exchangeability with the different days with this sort of potential outcome framework. And now, now from that, we go to the, we jump to the council graphs, okay? And we need somehow to connect the two, these two frameworks, two conceptual frameworks. And the way to connect this is either with the backdoor Criterion or either with the six, this single world intervention graph. Okay, this here. 
That's about generality. Actually, the, the connection is really with conditional exchangeability. So what they're going to tell you is that somehow when you have this sort of conditional exchangeability, given a particular factor, you are going to relate this with uh, these curves of graphs, right? Things like that. Okay. So let me write down then what the back door, back, back door criterion at least once. Factor criterion. Okay. So let's say that all factor paths between treatment and outcome are blocked by conditioning on L on these factors and L contains no variables. That are descendant of treatment of so this is the idea of the backdoor. So the backdoor paths, the way to con uh, to control for for these effects is just to block all those paths which go from between the treatment and the outcome. Okay, and they do not contain any descendant of A, right? So basically, this is telling you that you are controlling for all things like this. Okay, so this is so, sort of the definition of this sort of back, back door. So it, it also incorporates some extra definitions on the particular causal graph. So a summary of those. Uh, Extra condition is basically that the graph is a, is a good one. We have discussed these things before, but basically it incorporates ideas of faithfully, faithfulness. So you recall faithfulness is somehow the, at least my intuition behind it, is that you have a graph where the causal effects are not compensating each other. So it's not that you have causal effects that you don't see. So this is faithfulness for me. And then they have this other condition with a funny name, which is F. F R C I S T G, which is basically meaning bias, fully randomized, causally interpreted structure tree graph. So this is another way to say that the graph should be a good one, a causal graph, and it, it fulfills all the conditions that define uh, uh, a nice graph. The other one I was telling you is faith right? Okay, so when you have that and you have the definition of the background criterion, <clears throat> then you can argue that uh, you have conditional exchangeability if the background criterion works. Right, so this is basically, I was telling you before that we were trying to incorporate both frameworks, the one of the potential outcomes and the one of the causal graphs. Why? Because we see immediately the confounders in the potential outcome framework is basically a lack of exchangeability situation, right? And then they basically use this backdoor criterion to tell you, look, uh, I can uh, demonstrate that, uh, well, if the graph is behaving properly, then you can have conditional exchangeability uh, when you have the uh, background criterion working. Okay, so this is basically connecting the two the two frameworks. Okay, so when is this satisfied? Yeah. Okay. So the first easy graph when this is satisfied is this one, of course. Right? 
So basically here, uh, you don't have any backdoor paths. Yeah. Another structure that satisfies this is this one. Right? So L is a common cause of treatment and outcome. It doesn't have any descendants of A, just like this. Okay. And when you block this vector path, which is this one, then you have conditional changeability, right? And there is no unmeasured confounder here. Okay. So one important feature of this framework, although yesterday I was reading and there are some way out, is that basically this is not telling you the, the magnitude of the direction of compounding, compounding right? Even though there are, apparently there are some uh, techniques to do that. Okay, the, the, the magnitude of the direction? Yeah. So it's not telling you whether L is, well, you might think that maybe L is hardly, you know that it influences the treatment and the outcome, but yes, you know, in a very weak way, or it might be that it, it, it does it in a very strong way. I don't know, you can think of different cases. So those two scenarios, uh, well, apparently from this uh, general framework, you cannot distinguish. Although apparently, as I said, this I was checking on, on their way out. Okay, but just, just to mention it. Okay. So this is the key according to prep. So this is the main highlight of the course of revolution. This idea of the back door, back, back door uh, criteria. Okay. So let me use the next minutes to discuss some examples of this in action. One of these we have discussed last year, but not. That's it. Then I got it. Examples. Of the use of the backdoor criteria. Okay. So let's see. This one is called the healthy worker bias. Okay. So imagine that you have a five heart factor here, which is the you consider the Treatment, treatment, or you have a risk of death, which is the outcome. And then you have here uh, the fact of being fit. So, okay. So, you have an open backdoor. This is a simple example. You have an open backdoor path, which is this one. Right. So you can block this path by conditioning on, on this, on being the fact of being fit. Okay, and that should solve uh, the confounding effect. This is nice. So this is a simple one. So this is the case where you have a five factor fighter, it's influencing in some way the risk of death, and both the treatment and the outcome are influenced by this L, which is the fact of being. Being fit, being fit influences the risk of death, being fit influences the fact that you are a high fighter, high fighter or not. Okay, so this is a simple, simple scenario. We have complicated this now with what they call confounding. by indication of channeling. Okay. It's slightly different to this one. So imagine that you have aspirin, uh, yes, aspirin as treatment. And you want to have a risk, as well as a risk of a stroke. Outcome. Okay. And now you have here 
something which is, which is measured, which is where the guy has a heart or a heart disease. Help. But then you also have some sort of unmeasured effect. In this case, it's atherosclerosis. It's an unmeasured effect. So the atherosclerosis is affecting the, whether you have heart disease or not, and whether you have the risk of stroke. Right, so you have L, A, U, and Y. So this is a variant of the previous one where you have some sort of unmeasured uh, uh, effect. Again, you have this sort of backdoor path. Okay. So we, U is not measured. So there is no data collected on that. So you cannot block U, but you can block L. And that would solve the problem of the confounder. Okay. So the first one was simple. Is one, one where you are adding this effect, the fact that you have some sort of a measure uh, variable. But you see, you can still condition for the measure effect, confounder effect, which is this one. Okay. Go to another example, which they call reverse causation. <laughs> I mean, this is sort of easy, but then we get the more complicated examples in there. Okay, so reverse causation. So we, we have, for instance, exercise as treatment, the pretty as treatment. Then you have uh, gain risk. <laughs> Outcome. Okay. And now you have also a measure and measure effects, but in somehow different ways. So you have, uh, let's say, cigarette smoking. Uh, the founding factor, which is affecting the risk of death. And then you have as a measure variable, uh, let's say, for instance, personality. Which is affecting whether you smoke and whether you do mm -hmm. exercise. Okay. So I said this is called uh, reverse causation. And again, you can you just basically have uh, this sort of backdoor path where you have some sort of a measure uh, features. So that is like this. Okay. So again, you have some a measure effects and some measure effects. And when you condition for the measure effects, then you get a conditional exchangeability and you solve the problem. Okay. So these are sort of easy. Each of them, you might think of examples, which then this has an exam, uh, this has an application on ideas of genetic linkage. In genetics, when you have different genes which are uh, somehow connected in the genome and they are affecting a particular feature. But you can think of different examples beyond the fight fighter or the aspirin, et cetera. Right? So these are scenarios from the simple to this one where you, you can really control for the uh, confounders. Now we get to two which are more interesting. Which I will call, I'm going to put it like this. I would call that M bias. M bias, sorry. Okay. Um, the other one, if I find it. Yeah, on the other one, I will call it, let's say, and bias with a ring. Okay. So what happens with the N bias? Okay, so when you have the treatment, A, you have the outcome, Y, 
Okay, and then you have two unmeasured factors. Uh, the measure factor and another measure factor. Okay. And it's clear why they call it the end bias yeah, because of the shape of the graph. Okay. <clears throat> so which one is the which one is the backdoor path here? Is a backdoor path, something like this. Okay, so this is the backdoor path. And in principle, you should control for the entity which is much of its L. Okay. Now, the problem with this graph is that somehow uh, controlling for L is actually not helping us. Why? Because this is a collider. So you recall a collider was a fracture, something like this. So the path would be the vector path would be uh, a u two l one y. It's a collider. So when you uh, control for a collider, it opens this path. Otherwise, it's basically closed. Okay. The collider is actually called the explain away effect. So you can you can think of a scenario like. Uh, I remember last year, I think this idea of beautiful, beautiful people and intelligent people, and as a element in between, you had uh, whether they were actors or not. So you control for the fact that it's an actor here. Then you establish a connection between the fact that they tend to have uh, they are more beautiful and maybe less <laughs> less intelligent or whatever. I think, and it was called explain away effect. Okay, so the key point is how in this scenario where you have a collider, this collider, this path is already uh, it's already blocked, right? So in this scenario, the association uh, equates causation. Okay. In the in the in the language of the potential outcomes, then we would say that we have here unconditional exchangeability. But we do not we do not have conditional exchangeability, right? And then the M bias with with a wrinkle. Why okay. This is a funny one. So basically, it's the same structure before. So you have the treatment, and then the causal relationship with the outcome. Then we have and a measure affecting L and a measure, this one's affecting this one, this one is affecting this one, but the wrinkle here is that you have some sort of association here. Okay, so this is the difference to the other. So we have, we can identify two backdoor paths here. The first one, is a u2 l u1 y okay and the second one so this one this 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 one and the second one is a l u2 y Okay, so these are the two back factor paths that you have there. Okay, and now you could imagine that, okay, I can control this second path. Uh, I can block this second open backdoor path by controlling for L. So that's great. Control for this. But then the problem with this structure is that when you control for this to block this path, then you're opening the, the first Backdoor path. Okay. So in, in that sense, this bias is infectable. So you have a situation where you have a structure in the castle graph where, where by closing an open uh, backdoor path, you are opening a related path, right? So you don't have in this other language of the potential outcomes, you don't have neither 
a conditional exchangeability nor conditional exchangeability in the graph. Okay, so they they give you some potential solution, which I can put. I think the one that you have solutions. We have something like this. Go to a L two. Go to A. L or something like this. One, you want L one. Okay. Let me go through the solution to see at this one. One by solid. So let's say that we consider this as a, sol as a solution. So let's get this graph. Okay. So which vector paths you have here? Well, you can start in A, going to L2, going to U2, going to L, going to U1, going to Y. So this is this one. And the other one is A going to L, U1, Y. Okay. So you see immediately is that the fact that you included this second factor and it's a factor that you can measure, then that enables you to block this path by controlling on this L2, right? And the other one, you don't have to touch it because. This is a, a compound. Okay. So by including or by modifying this sort of M bias with a wrinkle, by including an extra variable, you are able to, to solve this sort of otherwise unsolvable situation. Right. So these are different examples from the simple ones. Uh, where you have all variables measure to situation where you have measure variables to situation where the uh, the shared structure of the graph is blocking the potential pathways. Then potential factor pathways. Okay. So to finish this, then we can. Argue that there. They argue that there are two structural forces of lack of exchangeability. Okay. The first one is the one that I was just highlighting the presence of common sources that is confounding. And the second one is the one that I was somehow highlighting in this M bias and the other one, which is that we are, by conditioning, we are introducing uh, new effects, which is what they call selection bias that I believe Ramon talked about. Okay. So again, to summarize uh, the second part of the chapter, so in order to connect the two frameworks, they introduce the idea of the backdoor criterion. Okay, the idea of the backdoor criterion is to control for, for what they call a backdoor path. And in that way you can uh, achieve conditional exchangeability. Okay, so you go from a situation where you don't have exchangeability to a situation where you have conditional exchangeability. And for that you use uh, the Coastal graphs, and these are different examples where you have different biases and how to control for them. Right? That's, that took us to this scenario of the M bias and the M bias with a wrinkle, where you have you are able to highlight in the two, two graphs that you know there are two ways or two forces to uh, to get or to obtain lack of exchangeability. One is the compounding, and the other one is the ideas of selection bias. Okay. 
So in that sense, the potential outcomes in my opinion then that opens the door of the feral approach, conscious approach in some way. Yeah. I think actually the historically uh, they use the potential outcomes, well, you might know better. They use the potential outcomes to clarify the confounding effects. That was a sort of very complicated uh, discussion. Um, I think that from that, uh, you know, all the machinery of Perl and the graphs came and it somehow simplified the, the ideas. And also then the key message is that somehow there was a sort of, and you are a statistician, so you know better, it was a sort of magic, no uh, situations where it was not clear whether you could control or not control. It was this sort of heuristic where you should control for everything that you had in your data. And so it seems that everything was like, you know, strange or, you know, depending on the case or the experience of the researcher. And this, and this is the argument that Pearl is giving. No? One of the main highlights of the cost of revolution is that it kills this problem forever, apparently. So, you know, we, we don't need to discuss crazy ideas about compounding. This is it. And we have the protocols. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if I get to the traditional approach. So what was the traditional approach? And this is really what I was discussing just now. Let me see. In the background, what can you do? Is this sort of clear until here? Okay, so let me write down the conditions that people using the traditional approach to answer the question, what is a confounder? Okay, so these were uh, sort of three conditions. The first condition is, well, it is associated with the treatment. Basically, this is basically telling you this sort of connection. Okay. The second condition is that it is associated with the outcome, conditional on the treatment. So, outcome Y, conditional. On the treatment. I think that this the last part of the definition comes from I think this, the intuition that they had that they wanted to isolate this sort of uh, interaction, controlling for uh, sorry. Ah. So this they want this have to to isolate the influence of the L on Y, not because of this. Okay, and I think that's why they had this sort of condition on the treatment. I think that's my intuition behind it. And then the third one, which was somehow new, so apparently it was not in the early definitions, is that it does not lie. in the causal pathway. Between treatment and outcome. Okay. So these were the definition of, of what was a co-founder. So co-founder, so it's associated with the treatment, it's associated with the outcome, condition on the treatment. And it does not lie in the causal path between A and Y. Um, well, okay, this seems, if you read it, well, it seems fine. Yes. You know, three points that to go for. Let me give you some example where it fails. 
I shall go back to the end bias, but I will put it here. So we remember the and bias. So you had, and okay, so you have the treatment, the outcome, two unmeasured features, then the confounder. This is what are trying to. Okay. So we knew, we, we know from the previous discussion that. Uh, L here is not a confounder. So because we have this sort of backdoor path and we have a collider, so it's blocked. And however, L, it is a confounder following the traditional definition. So why is that? Okay, but it definitely. So L is, is not a confounder. Okay, so why is this a confounder following the traditional definition? So let's go through the definition that we have here. So the first one is this associated with treatment. So we have U2 links L and treatment. The second one is it is associated with the outcome condition on the treatment. We have U2, U1, sorry. Shifting L with Y. Okay, second definition down there. And the third one is it doesn't it doesn't lie on the perfect path between A and Y. So A Y, and you don't have yes at all. Okay. So you see that even from this apparently. Uh, good definitions of confounders or the traditional definition that immediately the end bias is basically telling you that you have a situation where the new theory is basically telling us uh, it's not a confounder to the old theory, which is basically telling us it is a confounder. Okay. So the argument that they give in the in the in the book is that somehow then in these ideas of all ideas of association or statistical uh, criteria uh, are insufficient to, to really define what a confounder is. Uh, they tell you a sort of way out in this scenario. Let me tell you. Which is uh, sort of a new, new tool. She's basically telling you that it is a cause of the outcome. Okay, so here yeah, we were saying that this was associated with the outcome. Here yeah, it's telling you that it is a cause of the outcome, which is something that you don't have here. L is not causing Y. Okay, so that solves. Uh, this situation with the new definition, but then it doesn't solve other situations like this one that we've seen before. So following these uh, three components of definition and this new one, this is basically telling you that L is not a confounder in this graph, while we just have seen that it is a confounder. Okay. So you were saying uh, one, new two, and three, it would uh, solve this one, but then you find another one. one. two. So the problem is that with these definitions and the new two, uh, you are able to solve the end bias because then it happens that L is not a cause of the outcome. But but you can find other scenarios where it's telling you that 
this is not a confounder, but with the new uh, approach, it was really telling you that it is a confounder because you got an open backdoor path. Okay. So as you see, this is just an example, I think that they, they put in the, the book to tell you that, as I was saying before, you know, all these confounding uh, uh, discussions, this was sort of magic. We discussed last year that it was this heuristic of you know, controlling for everything. And this took all these sort of approaches to uh, a stable framework where you could really solve uh, this problem for, for good. Yeah, I don't know how much time I have left. So. Okay, what else? Okay, from this, you can see immediately that somehow uh, which element is going to be a confounder depends on the graph on how you solve it. Right, but the fact that you have a confounding effect is something clear. It's, it's clear. So either you have it or not. With this approach, you are able to quantify it. But which element in the graph is a confounder, or can you can you should control for it so that you get a conditional exchangeability? Well, it depends on how you approach the graph. And okay. I, I, there's somewhere. That, I mean, you put the graph. There's somewhere yeah. that will tell you. Well, I assume that maybe they, they give you uh, different alternatives to control for the confounding effect. Right. So they, uh, they will confirm that you have a confounding effect, but they, they might give you different alternatives to control for it, I guess. Yeah. And so the summary of all this is, of course, that uh, you do need a priori uh, knowledge, causal knowledge. And this is something that is basically killing me. That's killing me, yeah. No, because I mean, well, I will end with the last sentences about it, but you know. So we have one of the main highlights of the causal revolution, but then it brings some sort of uh, hidden trick behind it, which is the fact that you do need a priori causal knowledge. So, okay, maybe. But, but then, then there is this. Uh, I think it's spiritus or something. Yeah. That they say that they can claim build it from data, right? Well, uh, this is cause of discovery. Right. And like two weeks ago, I had a different answer to this question that I have now. So my reading now, this cause of discovery from realistic scenarios is extremely complicated. If not it's, impossible, it's extremely complicated, if, if not impossible. But I'm actually playing with some uh, simulated data to, to see. In certain situations, it's impossible. Yeah. In certain situations, it's impossible yeah. to build a, the causal to discover causal relationships from data. I mean, you have yeah, just two variables. You yeah. cannot say just looking at the data if one is the cause of the other or the other. Where yeah. we have yeah. There are two graphs that are compatible yeah. with the independent right. assumptions. Right. Yeah, I would say that there are two, uh, two, two comments on that. One is the fundamental difficulty. So you have what we discussed last year, so have classes of graphs that you know, uh, explain the same data. But the other one is the idea of really taking this to a sort of a large scale scenario. To what extent you will have you know, a very large data set who can really, in some way, uh, do some sort of causal discovery, which is ideally what we would like to have in the real world. And I think that's very difficult. I mean, I was I, I sort of tracking a scenario where they do that. So beyond the, the, the fundamental problem, is is then the applied problem of you know if I go beyond these sort of uh, toy graphs, if I go to a realistic scenario, can I really apply causal discovery? So that then I can play with all these ideas. And my answer right now is not really. So it has a lot of limitations. Actually, they have somewhere. I'm just looking for it uh, in the book. They discuss that. It, and they discuss, they discuss this issue too, and there seems to be a couple of papers by Page Robin seventy nine. Yeah, uh, where they, where basically they say that with finite data, yeah, the, the prospect, I mean, the whole enterprise is doing. Yeah, uh, but I think for a very large class of models. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, have five minutes, 10 minutes. 
three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> so let me finish then with this, at least giving you, okay, so I went, at least I went from, for the three points that I was wanted to tell you, these three ones. And then this idea of the single word intervention graph, basically, I can put it in a, in a single, single graph. Okay, as you see, we are discussing about potential outcomes and oops, sorry about curve. We are discussing about potential outcomes and we are discussing about graphs, but somehow it feels that uh, you know we would need to include the potential outcome in the graph framework, in the graphical framework. And this is what they do with this, what they call single word intervention graphs. So let me just put one, the single motif that I was discussing at the beginning, right? So this is the simplest motif. Um, so this would be the typical causal graph. And what they do is that they transform these type of graphs in what they call the tricks, where they split the treatment now in the different outcomes. So they do some sort of, that it's inheriting the, the structure of the graph and then you put here the potential outcome. Okay. So this is the idea behind the, this, this switch framework. So we were discussing for the exchangeability, we, we are discussing the potential outcome framework. Then with the backdoor criterion, we take Prelos uh, graphs and of course, people started to think of, okay, we have all these potential outcomes, but they're not in the, this framework. So how can we include the framework? Okay, they did this sort of generalized graphs. Uh, um, well, okay, so you can discuss a little bit about what these graphs are doing, et cetera. But I don't think I have much time. Finish with this, this graph is A is the- Yeah, A okay. is the outcome. And A is a particular uh, value of the outcome. It's a generic. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. They would, they could be A equal to one, A equal to yeah. zero, and then it would be the potential outcome associated to that. And there is a reason you know, how to deal with these graphs and so on, and how to control for confounders, confounders and so on. But so there, there is a graph per outcome per out per. So there's a graph for A equal one. Yeah. I mean, this is, that's why they call them single word intervention graphs. Because this uh, uh, represents a situation where you have a, a particular outcome. Right. I mean, it takes a little bit to to, this, to explain it, but uh, I don't think I have the time. But just to at least to tell you that, you know, with these tricks, they, they, the idea is to incorporate the potential outcome uh, on on this graph and based on uh, with the previous machinery. But Juan, yeah. what do they really give you? That you don't get from the other. I mean, it seems like in all the examples here, all they do is just like add the small a to the right of the large a, the capital A, yeah, and then just carry it through. Yeah, it's like yeah, okay, but I mean, then what? To be honest, yesterday I was like checking two YouTube's uh, explanation of this because I didn't really. It was like like reading this and saying, look, I, I'm probably missing something, but I, I don't I don't know what that missing is, and I didn't I didn't really get it beyond the idea that, okay, you have the potential outcomes and then you have these single scenarios where you can discuss the role of compounders, but it wasn't you, clear to can me. Can you discuss something here that you cannot discuss by going to the figure on the left? Uh, Apparently you can, yeah. It's easier to see that the um, that, uh, independence between treatment and potential outcome, a uh, condition on L is equivalent to the blocking all the backdoor paths, because here you have a explicit representation of the potential outcome in the graph. Okay, because yeah. the Y, A, because y, you see it yeah. there. And here you have two A's, like the, the A on the left is the is like the natural treatment, uh -huh. yeah, which means that is the treatment that you would take naturally. Like for instance, uh, if L is that uh, you have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, you might take a heart transplant naturally. And that's the reason for the arrow from L to A. And the other A is the treatment that you would take if they intervene, if they tell you take this treatment. And obviously not, that cannot have a cost because it's that they are telling you to, to, to take it. 
So you separate both, and that's the only one that is affecting the, the potential outcome. So here, the like here, this separation between A and Y condition on, on L is is clearly the same as as uh, as condition as changeability. Yes, I mean as soon as you discuss earlier that you have the backdoor criterion. I mean, you have demonstrated that the backdoor criterion is equivalent to conditional exchangeability. Then, for me, I mean, I, I, I did sort of, I got the same reading, but then I thought, okay, but it was somehow demonstrated already at the beginning when you illustrate the the, the workings of the backdoor criterion. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't. I mean, I understand what they do, but uh, yeah. But Roy, so you said that capital A and small A. The small a is the one you intervene upon, right? It's yeah. the one you fix by like degree, yeah. you're going mm -hmm. to be smaller. But sometimes that small a could have the same value as the capital A mm -hmm. for a particular value of the confounder, right? So yeah. Sometimes it can be the same, sometimes it can be different. You just I, like fix it by like degree. Sometimes it, yeah, so it can, can be the one that you naturally get. Natural. But in general, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to be able to introduce the, the, the potential outcome because you cannot, uh, otherwise, you cannot put an arrow between A and the potential outcome under one part. Oh, you need to, I mean, it's the, it's the only solution. Okay, just the last comment. Friend. That, of course, we had some other uh, approaches or techniques like this sort of uh, front door criterion that we discussed. Last year, and this is part of the uh, ideas of adjustment. So uh, there are situations. I mean, all these uh, strategies of adjustment that we have discussed in the standardization, IP, the weighting, etc. Uh, they rely on this conditional exchangeability. But you might have a scenario a situation like the one. Uh, let's say this one. Well, you cannot apply these techniques that I was showing you before, and we already saw last year that we have another uh, way out to control for confounding, and in this case, it's this idea of the front door criterion and so on. Okay. So anyway, I wanted to finish with the end message. Compare with the beginning, when I was telling you that this is one of the main highlights of the causal revolution. Okay. So. This evolves to an end message. Which is basically causal inference from observational data. Is a risky undertaking. Okay. So, I mean, so they're very happy with with the framework or how they they solve it. Uh, it solves the situation they're confounding, but at the end of the day. It's clear that it's, it's kind of difficult and you need a lot of a priori uh, uh, knowledge of the causal structures. It might be that you don't have the correct causal structure. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, they are controlling for different effects uh, based on a particular graph, which is not correct and so on. So that's why I think the end message is that, okay, we have the methods, but somehow still with observational data, this is a risk undertaking. And also, what you believe uh, today that it's correct might not be correct. Uh, That's right. Years. Yeah. So my question there is, you, I mean, you could always consider all this framework, this framework with different causal graphs, right? Like saying, look, this is the data. We might have two or three different uh, causal graphs that we believe that they explain the data or they explain the factors, and then we examine each of them. I mean, they do some sort of majority voting or something like that, like saying, look, at least in three out of four structures, we see that we have to control for this or that, then we do it. 
bueno, en el practicado escenario, es muy duro, pero bueno. I mean, this gives you some sort of, you know, okay, so confounding is not a magic uh, uh, approach anymore. That's fine. But on the other hand, it gives you a false security that you are really controlling for this because, you know, I understood the max. But still, it's a magical thing because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you depend, one depends on, on a particular graph that you are not sure about it. And you're, you're, probably you are going, you're not, never going to be sure about, about the graph. So in that sense, yeah, I don't know what you, you get out of But then, suppose you don't do that. And then you do just like multiple regression, then you are getting even less. And yeah. I mean, here, here you can say, these are my inferences conditional on yeah. the graph being a decent yeah. approximation to reality. Yeah. If you don't do that at all, then what do you yeah. do? Yeah, this reminds me actually one story you told me about some referee that was complaining about one of your papers. Mm. And then at the end, they discuss, you know, if you get some sort of guy complaining about what you have done, basically what you just said, Ramon, you can always argue, look, these are my cards. So this is a graph. And from that, I get these conclusions. You want to criticize that, then you have to criticize or somehow uh, put in front of me another different graph where uh, it is not the conclusion that I obtained, but the graph itself uh, that is wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is what they argue at the end, which is following your, your comment. Yeah, I guess, right. I guess so this, least, this gives you a way to like build progressively more better models because like when you throw about the firefighter, the activity and what, I mean, you can always say, well, it's not being a firefighter, but it's the activity. Well, let's suppose we now know that there are yeah. firefighters that never like to exercise or whatever. I mean, yeah. you can move forward, but if you don't, then what, yeah. what's the alternative? Yeah, yeah. Probably that's a way out there yeah. to argue that at least I have a framework where I can put my my a priori knowledge of the problem, and from there I can build a more complicated situation. 